Hi everyone. Thank you everyone for joining the talk today. The event is in collaboration with the Happiness Festival, organized by the Happiness Institute. The festival supports the WHO COVID relief fund. You can see the donation details via YouTube Giving. All donations can be matched to a uh, double by Google. We are honored today to have Dr. Robin joining us to discuss how to face emotional hunger. Dr. Robin is known as Oprah Winfrey's psychologist. She is a fearless truth teller and a trauma surgeon. She also conducts leadership training for organizations such as Johnson Johnson, Victoria's Secret, and IRS. Let's welcome Dr. Robin on stage. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. K, for inviting me. Uh, this is such an amazing moment and opportunity. Um, so thank you so much. I'm grateful to um, share this time with you. So here we are, we've gathered. Uh, what an important moment in time uh, in this country, in the US, that's where I am, I'm in Philadelphia, but also globally around the world. And uh, in a moment, I'm gonna be sharing uh, some thoughts with you um, that I want you to ponder with me uh, courageously. And But before that, I'd like for you to set your own intention. Um, this isn't just about me what I know, what I've learned, my expertise. It's about what do you want to get out of this time we're sharing? I believe that time is the one metric we can't ever get back when we waste time, which we've all done, uh, when we uh, fret and we worry uh, using our time and losing our time. Um, it cheats you and it cheats me. So I'd love for you right now just quietly in your own heart, in your own mind, set an intention for what you want to get out, uh, what you wanna take away, in what ways do you wanna gain something uh, from showing up and allowing me to show up with you. So I wanna share something personally uh, before we start talking about emotional hunger. That's what uh, my topic is today. I have a book called Hungry, The Truth About Being Full. A lot of what I'm sharing with you today comes out of that book. But before I do that, I feel that if I'm asking you to set an intention, asking you to open your own heart, I want to do the same um, with integrity and vulnerability. So just four weeks ago, uh, yesterday, I uh, my mother died uh, actually about five weeks ago. Um, somewhat unexpectedly, uh, quickly, very peacefully at her own home. Um, she was much older, vibrant, and on fire. She was fierce in so many ways. Um, so not only do I miss her, but I want to share that with you because uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar uh, says, and this is a quote I, I use all the time, we wear the mask that grins and lies. So what if I showed up today to talk about emotional hunger and I didn't say to you that my mother just died, that her uh, funeral was just four weeks ago in the midst of um, a pandemic. Um, she was such a vibrant and incredible woman who would have had a uh, robust uh, service with a lot of people there. And that wasn't possible because of the pandemic. And so what we did completely honored her, um, but it was small, it was intimate. Uh, it was very different than what I think she would have planned. I know that uh, for herself. But when we think of mask wearing and the masks that we all have to wear or many of us are wearing to keep ourselves safe, to keep other people safe, um, I wanted to just share with you something uh, about my own mask. So here's one mask and it's a little cumbersome because of this headset, but I'm going to just put this over. Uh-huh. You can't hear me well. Okay. That's one. It's the one I wear most of the time. Here's a colorful one. Um, another one. And here is the one we had for my mother's service. Um, it has her name and it says Rosa Lee Smith. That was her name. So why am I sharing that with you? Why did I share those masks with you? Because as Paul Lawrence Dunbar said, when we're thinking about emotional hunger, we've been hiding, so many of us, from what we really long for, 
what we want, what we need, what we desire and what we deserve. So I've wondered when I wear these masks to keep myself and others safe from COVID-19, I've wondered who people see behind the mask. I've wondered, do they see warmth in my eyes or do they see terror? Do they see sadness or do they see joy? I've wondered if people can see behind the mask. Uh, they can't see if we're smiling with our teeth. They can't see. So what if I came on today and I had to wear the mask the entire time? How would you feel me? How would you read me? And so much of what we're gonna be talking about has to do with the masks that you've been wearing, not to protect yourself from COVID-19, but to protect yourself from some of your fears, um, some of your tears, some of your heartache and heartbreak. And at times we've worn the mask and forgotten that it is a mask. It's not who you really are. So I wanted to share something personal about my own journey, where I am in my own life, and also to invite you tenderly with me uh, for these few moments we're together to take your mask off, to open your heart, to set your intention, and let's see what shows up for you and for me. So I wanna share uh, with you a couple of thoughts um, that I've had, and I think that it will um, lead us into a place of, um, I hope, uh, enlightenment and uh, some joy and some happiness. Emotional hunger is what I'm talking about and sharing with you today. It's your personal invitation to be human. So why did I say that? Uh, why is it your personal invitation to be human? Because so often uh, when we feel our emotional hunger, we hide. We hide from what we're longing for. We hide from our hunger. We distract ourselves uh, by shopping or food or uh, working out or sex. And I'll talk about that um, in a moment. But what's for sure is that when we think about hunger, healthy, being hungry is something much more and being healthy is something much more than what you eat. We can eat physically, really good, healthy foods and treats, but it does not mean that we are healthy on the inside. It doesn't mean that because we are in shape um, that our insides have been taken care of. So what are you hungry for? Hungry for what? You see that sometimes it's for food. Sometimes it's we're working out not only to be in shape, but we're working out because we want to feel like we've mastered something when our lives feel often so out of control. Right now with the pandemic, people being stuck at home, um, I know that countries and cities and towns um, all over the globe are beginning to open up and uh, the virus is spreading and there are places that were safe and now they're wondering about having to quarantine again. So this is not only about uh, what we're doing physically, what we're eating, how you're working out or shopping, but it's about what you're doing with your anxiety, with your fears, with your worries. And do you pretend to be okay when you're not. You know, I thought of a young woman who told me um, she was ashamed when she'd go out to a restaurant and she's single with other some of her other girlfriends who were single. And she said, I don't wanna be that girl. You know, that girl who seems like she's hungry for a guy. And I said to her, what's wrong with being hungry for a guy or hungry for a girl or, what, what's wrong with being hungry? We carry so much shame about our hunger. We're embarrassed often about being hungry for connection, hungry for love. You know, the statement like, I've got this, um, I'm fine, I don't need anything. 
is because we often actually are afraid to own that we're hungry, as if somehow being hungry is a disease. Our bodies, your body, my body, our brains, quite interesting. There's something called the amygdala. It's a little almond-shaped um, piece in the back of your brain. And the reason I want to share about the amygdala hijack, I want to tell you what that means. And sometimes when you are craving, not food, but craving connection, craving to feel valued and important and special and seen, the amygdala only knows two things. It knows that you're either um, safe or you're in danger. So it either you're either fleeing something that you're afraid of or you're fighting it. The danger in this, sometimes it's kept you and me safe, no question. I mean, when there is real danger, it, it alerts us. I mean, it's the alarm system. And because it doesn't have any reasoning capacity, any ability to say, uh-oh, I'm actually not in danger. Uh-oh, my hunger, my emotional hunger is not dangerous. It's part of being human. And so the amygdala, when it is hijacked, that means when you are scared to death. And what do I mean? I don't mean of a robber. I mean scared that maybe someone knows that you care and maybe you're not sure that they do. Maybe you're terrified that you say you love someone, maybe to a parent, and they aren't able to say it back to you. And maybe you're wondering, what does that mean about you? What does it mean about your value? So you get hijacked. And when we are hijacked, we can overreact, we can underreact, we can retreat, we can withdraw, we can become aggressive. And so it's important to realize that that part of our brain that only knows danger or safety can really mislead you and me when we're talking about our emotional hunger. It can make you stay in a relationship that's really bad for you because you feel like you can't survive on your own. That's that amygdala. That's that part of your brain that's very old, that even if you're an adult and you take care of yourself and you pay your own bills, that can make you feel like you're inadequate, that you're not enough. So I want us to be aware that our body and our brain is guiding a lot of our behavior. And so we need to understand that and be sensitive to that. Okay, so identity theft. Look at this slide. There's a pretty powerful lion and uh, then a picture of um, a rabbi and a, and a student. So what I wanna share about identity theft, and then I'll come back to um, the slide in just a moment, but I wanna talk to you about identity theft, what it means. You may think, okay, Dr. Robin, what do you mean? Like you talking about my credit cards got stolen? Or do you mean my bank account number is stolen? Mm -mm, not that, something actually even much more serious. Your identity, who you were born to be, not who your parents wanted you to be, not who society says you should be, not the ways in which you fit in because someone else says so, but what was your divine appointment and assignment? Who are you really meant to be? There's a story I tell in Hungary, um, and I really wanna pose this to you, about what does it mean um, if I said to you or someone said to me, has anyone seen Robin? When's the last time anyone saw me? When's the last time anyone really saw you, the real you? Did you even know that you've been missing? Did you know that your identity had been stolen, had been taken away? Did you know that you've been walking around as if you are someone who you're actually not? And you're wondering why the clothes you're wearing, the thoughts you're wearing um, aren't really fitting. So the lion story, the reason I had that lion up there, um, there's a quote that says, the lion's story 
can never be told by the hunter. The hunter can't tell the lion's story because the hunter will change the story. The hunter will tell a very different story and narrative about the lion than the lion would tell of its own journey. And I'm wondering who's been telling your story? What lion, I mean, in what way are you the lion, but there have been hunters in your life? They're writing a different narrative. They're telling a different story. They're actually acting as if you are satisfied when you're not, that you're happy when your heart is aching, that you actually feel that you feel fulfilled at your job when you're actually every day dreading going, dreading logging online right now because most people are actually not able um, to go to work, they're working from home. So this is an invitation that as your identity was stolen to realize that you no longer want the hunter telling your story. And then there is this question um, that the rabbi was asked. His students said, Rabbi, we really want to ask you something. And he said, of course, anything. And they said, Rabbi, in the afterlife, what will we be asked? So they were waiting for this deep and profound response. And very quietly, he said, you won't be asked why you weren't Moses. And you won't be asked why you weren't David. You will be asked why you weren't you. And so as we're talking today about emotional hunger, about the shame we often feel for this very essential part of our humanity, which is to be hungry, to be hungry physically, to be hungry psychologically, to be hungry emotionally. And when we deny that we are hungry, when we pathologize that we are hungry, and then we start hiding that, that is what makes us weak. It is what makes us sick. It is what actually um, turns what could be an opportunity and has it going um, against us. So starve the lie and feed the truth. That's what this is about today. It's about starving the lie, the lie that you're not good enough, the lie that you should have been like your brother, the lie that it would have been easier had you been a girl, not a boy, or a boy, not a girl, or if your sexual orientation had been uh, something other than what it is. We want to starve the lie, the lie that says you're not good enough. And we want to begin to feed the truth, the truth that you are whole and complete just as you are. Invisibility. Invisibility is the greatest wound we carry. A lot of what we're seeing in the world right now, a lot of the wars and the protests and the pain have to do with invisibility the pain of not being seen, what it feels like to have people look right through you. And then the healing that comes when someone says, I see you. And I put underneath, I see you, the I see you, like in the hospital, because really what is happening right now around the globe, it's like we all need to check in to a hospital, not for COVID-19, but for our terror of being fragile and resilient. We want to just be resilient. We don't, we, it's like we've, we've made vulnerability, we've made tenderness a weakness instead of that it is part of your birthright and mine to weep and to smile, to worry and to find resolve and answers. So being seen is something that we are all hungry for. And you never want to minimize what it means um, for you to be hungry. There's something in uh, my book, Hungry, The Truth About Being Full. It's called The Hungry Litany. And I'm going to be putting up, um, you'll be able to go to my website, drrobinsmith.com. Um, you will be able to download this Hungry Litany. It's being created as we speak. Um, so it will be up there soon for you to visit the website and download it. But I want you to think about what are you hungry for? 
I'm going to share with you just a little bit, a few of my own lines uh, from Hungary and what I said in my own litany. I mean, it was something I wrote and people have said to me, Dr. Robin, is that real? Like, did you really write that? And I said, yeah, I did. And it just poured out of me. It says I'm hungry uh, for real love, not crumbs I try to call a meal. I'm hungry for relationships where respect is the cornerstone of the connection. I'm hungry to be in relationships that don't require me to dim my bright light. And it goes on to talk about what I am truly hungry for. I want you to think about and really ask yourself courageously, very quietly and safely, what is it that you really are hungry for? What are you longing for in your own life, in your own relationships? Have you started um, or continued to call crumbs a meal and tried to act like you were full on something that is empty and uh, vacant and unworthy of you? And if so, today is your opportunity. No shame, no blame. I call shame and blame the toxic twins. But today is your moment where you can take yourself seriously. You know, sometimes we want to be taken seriously uh, by other people, but we're not taking ourselves seriously. Wake up, show up, grow up, rise up. What does it mean to wake up? It means to step into this moment, saying that it's not yesterday's moment, but it is your opportunity today to show up awake, alive, recognizing that you have an opportunity to do something different in this moment than maybe in any other moment in your life, to show up. Well, report for active duty, which means in get, getting rid of excuses. And I talk about having the combination of uh, compassion and accountability, having those two things come together. It's important if you have compassion without accountability, uh, sometimes that's impotence, might feel good, but you don't have any momentum to move. And if, if you have accountability without compassion, sometimes that can feel brutal. I mean, the truth will set us free, but we don't need to have the truth beat us up. And as I said, shame and blame never ever move us. It's certainly not in, in a sustainable way. To grow up, you know, the Bible has a passage that says, when I was a child, I thought like a child, I behaved like a child, I acted like a child. When I became an adult, I put away, I got rid of some of those childlike things. So being in your life, taking care of your emotional needs and your emotional hunger is something that it requires you to grow up. It's not an age. It's in commitment to yourself and to your life and to rise up, to stand in that place where you are accountable and responsible for the life that you want to have, that it's not someone else who's going to make this happen for you, but it's you. You know, there is a line from uh, an older movie. Uh, it was called Out of Africa with Robert Redford. And Meryl Streep was a great movie if you haven't seen it. Uh, but there's a line that Robert Redford has in that movie. And um, I love this line. He says, I don't want to get to the end and find out that I'm at the end of somebody else's life. And so part of this emotional hunger and the reason it is your invitation to being human is because this is your chance and opportunity to decide that you're not going to be ashamed of your longings. You're not going to be afraid of what you desire. You're actually going to begin to tenderly and honestly embrace it. Fearless. My company is called Fearless One, but fear less. What does it mean for you to fear less? It means that you do things, even when you're afraid, that fear is not your excuse to not show up, to not report for active duty. But it's not about having no fear. Part of being human, part of being hungry is that fear shows up with opportunity. But fear less, 
fear less today than you did yesterday. And you will hopefully have less fear tomorrow to embrace yourself, all of yourself uh, tomorrow, that you'll have more courage and less fear. So happiness is a decision. Choose it. It doesn't mean that your happiness is going to look like my happiness. It doesn't mean that your happiness is going to uh, mirror the happiness in your family. But it does mean that you've got to make a decision that whatever it takes for you to be happy, that it is your divine birthright and that you're not going to live your life, uh, be in your life, and certainly not leave your life without choosing happiness. Your happy place. Do you know what your happy place is? I mean, I know for me, my happy place is nature. It is the woods. It is water. It is swimming and the beach. I can't do some of those things. I can do the woods right now, um, practicing social distancing. Can't go to the beach. But it's important that you think about what is your happy place. And even if life is tough, and I'm not naive, let's just remember, my mother just died um, somewhat unexpectedly, and I have a longing and an ache, and I miss her. And yet it is my responsibility to make sure that I cultivate happiness and joy uh, in my life in the face of grief and sorrow as well. So love after love, there's a poem I want to share with you. It says there's a, and, and it's, I, I think as we look for love, uh, it's a cliche in all the wrong places, love after love is an invitation to remember um, that love really starts and the love affair we need is the one that we have with ourselves. So the time will come when with elation, you will greet yourself arriving at your own door, in your own mirror, and each will smile at the other's welcome and say, sit here, eat. You will love again the stranger who was yourself. Give wine, give bread, give back your heart to itself, to the stranger who has loved you all your life, who you ignored for another. Take down the photographs, the desperate notes, and peel your image from the mirror. Sit and feast on your life. So often we're looking for someone else to be elated that we are alive, someone else to be elated that we survived hell, someone else to be elated about our opportunities and we forget it. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. Look, I, I celebrate when people are elated with and for me. But I will tell you this, it's a secret, but it shouldn't be, that if you become your own source of happiness and joy, whether other people rejoice with you or over you or because of you is only a cherry on top. It's not something that you need to propel your life. It's not something you need for momentum, and it is not something you need to feel validated. And so I just want you to remember that your life actually um, and taking care of it is your responsibility. It is also your privilege. I want you to remember, um, don't waste your, these are three tenets that I live by, uh, and I want you to hold these uh, close to your own heart because remember I started off by saying, Time is the one metric that we can't ever get back. So please don't waste your time. Don't waste your life and don't waste this moment. So before I take questions, um, if there are any, and uh, we open it up for those of you who have uh, joined me and um, shown up, which I really appreciate, um, there's a song that uh, is a blessing to me. And I just want to share this with you. Many of you around the world probably know this, uh, but it says, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, 
I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. This little light of yours, please let it shine. This little light of yours, please let it shine. This little light of yours, please let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Let's do that together. So now there may be questions. I'm going to come and share uh, my screen with our host and our moderator. Thank you very much, Dr. Robin. It's a very uh, sweet energy, joyful energy, like the sun. Uh, it's a source of light. Thank you very much. You. Um, so let's see if we have questions. Um, so yeah, so first question is, uh, I think a standard question we ask to all the speakers as part of the festival. Um, what does happiness mean to you? Yes. You know, happiness um, to me means that I am my own barometer. Uh, that I know what brings me joy and I know how to make that happen. And so happiness is being connected with my source and my force, uh, regardless of what is going on in my external world. Awesome. Cool. Uh, next question. Um, what practical advice do you want to give to the global audience going through the current crisis? I think this is a good one to summarize maybe a few points from the talk as well. Yes, yeah, for sure. Uh, thank you for that question as well. You know, as we are uh, in this pandemic, and I mean, I don't know about you, uh, but it blows my mind. It really does. I mean, most of us have, uh, I mean, my mother was old, but even she, uh, she was 98 years old. Um, but she had not experienced that. She'd experienced the Great Depression here in the US. But to be in a pandemic, um, have the world shut down, uh, which is terrifying and, um, hear this from me, um, it's necessary, it's important. Uh, we, don't, we can't choose it. So people say, well, what do you mean? You think the pandemic is good? I say, of course not. But because I don't have a choice in it, I wanna figure out how does it benefit me? And so as I think about what are some of the very specific things that people can do uh, to manage their happiness, to um, uh, harness happiness, actually, one thing for sure is to stay engaged. And I have the three moves. Move your body, because a lot of times when we are afraid, we get paralyzed and we don't move. So move your body move your brain. That means if you have a negative thought, don't get married to it. It's okay to have a, I mean, a negative thought, but let it come and let it go. And then move your burdens as well. Because at times when we are burdened by something, we are afraid, we will rehearse it again and again and again. And what we rehearse grows. Remember I said, starve the lie and feed the truth. So if we can starve the lie that this pandemic is going to last forever and life is never going to be good again, that's a lie. And so we want to starve that and begin to feed that there are connections that are happening all over the globe that would never have been able to happen like you and me had there not been this moment. Yeah, great. I think it's probably um, applied to many people that uh, the pandemic is a once in, in a lifetime experience. And I think everybody find it very challenging. Um, but at the same time, it's also an opportunity for many things for us to connect deeper with each other and to create um, a place like the, like the Happiness Festival where all these amazing speakers can come together and share their ideas with the world. So yeah. definitely there are two sides mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. So next question. How do we know what we are hungry for? Mm. Well, I love the question. Thank you, whoever asked that. Uh, you know, one of the, the ways to know that is what are we avoiding? Um, what is there, you know, where in your life 
Have you been pushing a thought back, pushing a desire back, uh, shaming yourself, saying, oh, I'm too old for that, or I'm too young for that, or I'm too whatever, fill in the blank, or too little um, for this. And so often our hunger resides in what we're hiding from. And so if we can ask ourselves, what am I hiding from? You know, I'm hiding because I don't want, I had a woman tell me that um, she her, she was raised Catholic and she said, you know, her grandmother would turn over in her grave if her grandmother knew that she wasn't, you know, practicing as a Catholic anymore. And I said, okay, well, you know, is your grandmother, how long has she, did she, has she been dead? And she said, oh, she's not, she's still living. And I'm waiting for her to die so I can, not that she wanted her to die, but so that I can live being who I really am. And so she was hiding from a very deep part of herself that knew that Catholicism, at least at that stage of her life, wasn't where she belonged. Yeah. So if we look for what we're hiding from, we can often find what we're hungry for. Interesting. I think there is a lot about fear as well, right? And also walking yeah. from the shadow and uh, yeah. Yes. A lot about fear. You know, and thank you for saying that because and and fear is not bad in and of itself, but the shame of fear. You know, I don't know about you, but sometimes if I say to someone, "Oh, are you afraid?" "Oh, no, 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 I'm not afraid." And I'm like, well, I am. And then they'll say, oh, me too. And so often, if we would tell the truth, and particularly people like me, I mean, I'm a psychologist and ordained minister and all the TV things. So people see a uh, an intact person. If I do not tell them that my heart bleeds, if I do not tell you that I get confused and I'm also on the path with you trying to find my way, it then creates an image that is unreal. And so, so often we are pursuing images of people that don't even exist. And if we were to show up authentic and real and we weren't so terrified, so terrified of what's under the mask. You know, in, in my book, Hungry, I tell this story. It's not a true story, but it's an analogy of someone coming to ring my door, my doorbell, and I think it's my neighbor. So. I get my mask on for the neighbor. And then I get to the front door and I realize, uh-oh, it's my coworker. And I say, oh, hold on just a minute. I don't have the key because what I'm really doing is the mask for the neighbor is not the same mask as for my coworker. So I got to go in my mask drawer and get out the other mask. And how often do we have all these masks and who we really are is just so hungry and so longing to breathe and come out safely. Yeah, authenticity, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Very, very true. Um, mm -hmm. Let's move on to the next question. How closely can we compare emotional to physical hunger in the sense of starving ourselves when we have no other option? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, what a, thank you for that question. Uh, and I'm sensitive to the fact that physical hunger around the globe is so pervasive um, that there are people in every area um, of our world who are going hungry. And uh, we here in the US have seen food lines, I mean, for hours and hours in the hot sun where uh, whether people are rich or poor, um, they're out of work and they're physically hungry. So I'm sensitive to A, the realities of that and the same desperation of those people is the same desperation for emotional hunger that we can starve. I have something in the book, it's called emotional anorexia and it's talking just about that, that starvation is one of the worst ways to die, physical starvation, and also emotional starvation. When we are eating crumbs and calling them a meal emotionally, when we're saying that a relationship is satisfying and we are dying on the vine because we're ashamed or because we think that if we were strong enough or we had enough faith that somehow, you know, we would be able to work this out. And so emotional and physical uh, starvation and hunger are very, very similar. Um, emotional 
anorexia is very similar to uh, physical and medical anorexia. They both they both kill. One kills the body, and the other kills the soul. Very very interesting. Um, cool. Next question. Won't people make mistakes when they decide for what they are hungry? For example, someone who wants to be famous might not actually like being famous. What tips do you have for identifying true hunger? I think mm. it's really about figuring out your true self in a sense, because this is so much, you know, part of that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's so interesting that uh, before writing Hungry, I wrote a book called Lies at the Altar, the truth about great marriages. And it's not just about great marriages. It's really about knowing the self. Like you can't have a great anything. I can't hire a great contractor unless I know what are my needs and who am I really? Not who do I want to be, not who did someone else say I am, but who am I in my deepest core? So it is true that someone who longs to be famous and then gets becomes famous and then hates being famous, does that mean that they didn't really have a genuine longing or that maybe there was a part of themselves that they did not understand? I mean, there are a lot of um, very successful, famous actors and musicians who are shy. Uh, I mean, I spend my life uh, on a stage of some sort. Now it's, you know, a camera and a computer, um, but it used to be in front of thousands of people. And I will look forward to when I can go out and touch people and dance with them in the aisles again. Uh, but I am also shy and people can't believe that. They're like shy. I'm like, yeah, I mean, that's a that's a part of me. And so if I don't know that part of me, then I wouldn't know how to take care of myself so that when I go out on stage, I am fully present. And then when I come home, I'm with a ponytail in the, in the woods, um, you know, hiking or doing something that is very quiet and very under the radar. And so it is very much about who am I? Who am I really? and what really would meet the desires of my heart. Yeah, so what do you recommend in terms of practical um, method or exercises for people to do this kind of self-discovery? Because it's, I think it's all about discovering who you are and what your emotional needs are. Is it gonna be a solo exercise or it's better to be a conversation or it's like a group exercise? Do you yeah. have any, any tips? I do, and thank you for asking. Um, it starts solo. So I would say that I always uh, remind people that this work is an inside job. It's kind of like a bank being, you know, they talk about a bank heist and they say, oh, it was an inside job. No one could have known all of what was known except for someone on the inside. And so this is an inside out uh, journey. It's got to start solo, but it can't stay solo. Uh, we have to find, not have to, it is part of the journey to connect with someone who is safe, who is kind, who will be tender to the feeble parts of ourselves. You know, that often when we are uh, disappointed in ourselves, again, we hide. And so we have to find a way to come out of the closet, if you will, with our disappointments, with the ways in which we are feeble and uh, weak in certain places. And again, see, we hear weak and say, oh, I don't want to be weak. Of course, we're all weak in certain places. And if we can claim that uh, in terms of something very concrete that you start with yourself, journaling can be very helpful in terms of self-discovery. And then connecting with a partner um, who not only will listen to you, but who is willing to share and be vulnerable themselves. You know, this one way sharing isn't really sharing. Um, if I'm going to take my clothes off and emotionally and psychologically and spiritually and financially, um, I don't want to look at someone who's telling me like everything is great. You know, there's something in the black church here in the United States. You'll hear people say, how are you? And they'll say, I'm blessed and highly favored. And I think, Okay, sometimes that's true, but I'm always waiting for someone to say, 
I'm blessed because I'm still alive, but my life is a mess. And so when we can do that real time, uh, starting journaling, so we become familiar with our inside world and then creating connection with someone who is safe, who will do the same, those are good ways to begin. Cool, great. Thank you very much, Dr. Robbie. Um, I definitely will try this myself. Um, so let's go to the last question. Okay. How do you recommend navigating conversation with family friends who do not understand the choices you make that will bring you the true happiness and, and feel most aligned to your identity? Mm. So I think that's kind of a natural extension of after you know yourself, how do you communicate with yeah. your wow. close group? Yes, thank you um, for that question. and. I love that question. I feel like it's the perfect last question. Um, I might say that if there was a next last question too. So, but, um, but I love this question. I'll tell you why. Because as we are uh, starving the lie and feeding the truth, as we are claiming our own life um, as our own, as we decide that the lion story can never be told by the hunter. And so we want, that's, that's what that question is about. Like, now I know my own story but my family doesn't get me. They don't understand me. And what do I do about that? So we're talking about issues of loyalty and love. Um, it's fine to love your family. It's fine to have loyalty to them. But part of this journey is about making sure that your first loyalty is to yourself. And that can really short circuit people. They're like, oh wait, even culturally, so many of us have been raised to say, well, but you've got to honor you know, your elders and you have to honor your family and they matter to you. That's true. But you've got to begin to matter to yourself more than anything else. And when we can do that, we can come from a place of deep compassion to those who understand us and also those who don't, because sometimes we want our families to get on board because we are hungry, here we are, for connection. Nothing wrong with that, but to try and make our families become something they are not because we have grown in a certain way is also not owning the fact that we need to bless our path and journey and we need to bless them to, to be whoever it is they are, even if we don't make any sense to them. So I've had that happen in my own life. There are people in my family who think that, you know, like what I'm doing and how I live and my spiritual practices make sense. There are other people who are mm, not quite so sure. And so sometimes that has been painful. At an earlier stage in my life, I was stirred um, because I wanted to be known. I wanted them to know me. And at some point I realized that actually who needed to know me was me, who needed to accept me was me, who needed to rejoice in me was me. And that that would attract some other people who also could be on this journey with me. Sometimes it's not our, our biological family. Sometimes it's the family that we choose. It's the tribe that we create. Interesting. Yeah, I think it's really much about um, almost negotiating with your close network uh, in terms of what your hunger are and what theirs are, because it's yeah. always a fine line, so give and yeah. take as well, two way street, um, which is also a very valid thing for COVID because now people are spending so much more time with their family, you know, 24 seven. So I think yeah, yeah. this kind of conversation probably come up much more often as well. Yes. Yeah. And I think, and, and it's scaring people because they are with their families, as you just said, 24 seven, there are also people who are with their significant others, their partners or spouses, you know, they worked outside of the home and all of a sudden they are now faced with, is this marriage something that really brings me happiness and joy? Um, if so, you know, what is that going to look like? Because it's a different, it's a very different equation and paradigm uh, with not only the physicality of being with family, but emotionally that this pandemic um, has created such terror and, and change for everyone that we are vulnerable in a way that we've never been before. 
Definitely. And I think this is also the reason why we need to have this talk, because this addresses, you know, this huge topic about emotional desire and hunger during this pandemic. And I think mm -hmm. Dr. Robin has given us some really good insight from her experience on this topic. So thank you again for Dr. Robin's uh, talk today. And I hope everybody enjoyed the session. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.